I just came back to Calgary. Every record store I went recommended you guys. Every single one of them. So, yeah, no, it, it was really like that's how I heard first heard of you, and that's why I like when I Instagrammed you was like, "Can I have you come on the show?" And you're like, "Okay, we'll figure something out." And yeah, so yo, you, you had such a. I have a friend of mine. Her name you might know her as Jolty. She basically used to work at a record store. She recommended you guys she's been a friend of mine for years she big time recommended you guys and then uh not only that then when i asked around like the reaction i got from everybody i was working the records like oh these guys are really good so whatever you're doing man it's working <laughs> well thank you man i appreciate that yeah so this is this like your is this i'm not gonna say this is your day job yet but this is this something like like is it is it becoming bigger than you thought it would be yeah, I mean, it, it basically has become my day job. I mean, I work on this stuff usually about eight hours a day, whether it's through music production or all the extra stuff we have to do kind of in and around just the music, right? Because I'm the guy that does all the web development, all the merch designs, all the logistics. So, yeah, it pretty much is like a full-time job for me. But as for the for the other guys, you know, like they still live their lives, work their day jobs, et cetera. But they, uh, it, it, it definitely is getting a lot bigger and a better response than – we anticipated and that's a good thing that just means that our hard work paid off absolutely no totally well the thing is you when you do anything like this no matter what kind of art form you get into like you're just putting yourself out there and they're saying here i am this is what i do you don't know if it's ever gonna like click you hope so but you never actually know and there's kind of a little bit of a timing is everything aspect to it so like like what makes you like is it just been like a slow build? Has it just like, or the last little bit, just something clicked? What do you think it was? Well, I mean, it's a little different for us because I mean, we started about five years ago as a band. Um, first EP came out four years ago, first album two years ago. And we're just kind of working off of that two year cycle. Um, but the difference is we had, you know, COVID and lockdowns on that last two year cycle. So for us, there was nothing else to really do but to write and put out the album. So, I mean, we weren't really doing anything different than what we normally do other than, you know, we've put a lot more focus into our writing and a, a ton more work into our production. Like eight hours out of my day is spent just working on music production, right? So there's there's a big element to that. But I think it's just something where people liked the first album and they kind of knew what to expect. It was, it was pretty much on the level of what they were hoping it would be. But then when the new album came out, I think it kind of hit them a little differently because they received a bit of a dose of something different, almost like a um, a more evolved sound for what we were going for, especially for power metal. So I think that's something that's kind of led to a little more of a positive response from people. Instead of saying, yeah, this is that exact like middle of the line that we were expecting. Now they're like, oh shit, like this actually kind of blew us out of the water a little bit and wasn't what we were expecting, but we like it. And I think that's something that's working pretty positively for us right now. No, I, that, no, I just, Sometimes it's like first, I always feel like with a lot of bands, the first album is about figuring out what your voice is, like whatever mm -hmm. that actually is. And the second album is like, okay, we know who we are. Let's see where we can take this. Is that, is that accurate? Do you feel like that's a, an accurate description of this? Yeah, I'd say that's absolutely exactly what it is. Yeah, very cool. So like you started five years ago. Did you do other music previously or, or this is just something you just finally just said, I'm just going to go for it? Uh, no, like we've all played in other bands and things like that, especially in and around Calgary and, you know, Western Canada. But for the most part, this is kind of, I guess, a pretty serious project as far as, you know, investments and time and all the different kind of things that we're putting out there, you know, running advertisement and PR campaigns and things like that. So, yeah, this is definitely the the biggest thing we've been a part of. Yeah, it's, that's super cool. So I. So. I guess you all bring different stuff to to the band. I don't you may not want to speak for them entirely, but what I was kind of wondering is, like you guys have a very again very cool power metal sound. I mean, there's like like which I really dig. It's got a little bit of a European European a little bit reminds me a little bit of some of the European stuff I listen to. So is that like a huge influence, like the Night Wishes, the Blind Guardian kind of stuff, or just even other things like that? Yeah, it's pretty much an amalgam between, you know, European style power metal and American style speed metal, right? Like you're trying to pull from elements of the 80s without being too 80s. But that's the same way we pull from most elements. You know, we don't pull 
from black metal to become a black metal band, but there's certain elements of that music that could be, you know, a way to enhance what we do. And so that's essentially how we piece it all together, right? Totally. Um, but I also, got, I, again, I'm also of the belief too that no matter who you are, the best art usually comes from something inside you that really resonates with you. So going back, going forward, so what were the 80s like albums that you get that you dug? Because the, like, there's some that make me pop and there's some that are really deep and heavy. So which, which ones did you like gravitate towards? Uh, I mean, without speaking too much for the other band members, but um, for me, it would be early Halloween and Blind Guardian albums were ones that really kind of resonated with me, right? And, you, and I'm sure a lot of people can hear that when they're listening to our style, right? You're trying to maintain an element of speed and aggression while still having clean vocals and, you know, catchy choruses on top of it. Like, it's a bit of a balancing act that comes into it, but... I feel like some of those older, you know, especially the German speed metal albums, they're the ones that kind of held on to that line a little better over time rather than other people where they're going just straight speed metal or going further into the more aggressive genres kind of thing. Well, I, I think, I think, uh, well, what I love about like power with like European style is there's still a big, heavy classical music element to it. I honestly think that there, there is a big respect for story structure in music. In metal, especially in that form of metal, it's a big, big part of what to do. Blind Guardian, you mentioned they, they did that. They they do it all the time. I mentioned Nightwish, they do it all the time. But there's a, I, everybody from that area still maintains a very solid class of work. I think maybe I just in my opinion, metal fans are probably the biggest music, music bleh, the biggest music fans on the planet. Yeah, I mean, definitely the biggest music nerds on the planet, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah really. well, You know, they, they dig in deeper than most music consumers, right? It's all about the um, the band's roster and their history and any little fun Easter eggs and tidbits. Like, they definitely get really involved with their bands, the, the bands that they like. And that's the kind of thing for us that we notice, too, that our fans are very deeply embedded into our history already, as is. And so they kind of... It, it works really well too because it works as a check and balance for us like we know if we veer off the path too much because like our our fans will let us know they'll be the first to say hey this sounds like shit or hey, this is a great, <laughs> right or or hey this is a great evolution of what you guys you know did on the first album and you know i think it's fucking awesome and keep it up right so totally no i i i it's an interesting balancing act too because i think every band needs to experiment a little bit you know it brings you to the dance but it's always better if you keep it keep evolving your duels because that way when you go back to what brings you to the dance you can come at it with a different dimension and brush than what you had before mm -hmm. absolutely yeah so okay so i, I guess i'll ask this then so two albums in i, I just saw you guys released a video so how much of your time like you just mentioned there's a big part of your time is production right now so do you guys still get together and like do video kind of stuff do like performances online like is that a big part of what you're doing right now in light of this very bizarre time or well right now we're kind of well i say we i'm focusing currently on twitch streaming and just kind of working through a lot of the musical processes that we normally go through but streaming that process right and the thing for us is you know for example with like our pre-order campaign there's a bunch of people that you know if you contribute x amount we'll do a cover for you and so we have you know seven or eight of these cover songs to work through now and instead of just sitting in our dark corner in our room, working on them and eventually saying, okay, here, they're ready. Now we're kind of showing the process of us working on them and working through them just to kind of keep a little more with that engagement because obviously we, we can't tour right now and it's, it's continuously an issue. And I don't know if people know this, but anybody that goes to play in the U S like if you're Canadian, you go to play in the U S it's about $5,000 to file for visas just to go and play there. Let up, whereas, you know, if Americans want to come here, they don't have to pay for shit. They just have to file the paperwork. So, you know, there's a lot of disadvantages to being a Canadian artist and to trying to tour within Canada, even because the spaces are so vast. So the easiest way that we can close that gap is doing things like Twitch streaming, you know, working on some extra production outside the album, because if we just went right back into the writing cycle, we'd basically be shut ins for the next three months. And then, you know, at the end of the next year, you'd see another album out and ready. And that's that's not as big of a payoff for us right now as it is connecting with our actual fans talking with them you know keeping them in loop with our processes and trying to do anything outside of the box that we can do right now 
no, it makes sense. Like, I think one of the biggest things about being an artist, doesn't matter what your genre, band, like whatever, whatever you're into, like audience connection is, is an absolute must. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. You cannot, you can no longer afford not to do stuff. And because the fact of the matter is, like, because of things like Twitch, because of things like YouTube, it's all accessible. You know what I mean? It, like, there's a lot more access than what even in the past. So that's why, like, you're probably you're probably a part-time engineer, like like full-fledged in terms of computer, sound, video, right? Because you have to be in today's age. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The amount of money and time I've invested into gear just for streaming, let alone being a musician, like, that's... It's been a big, big journey, but it, it's been paying off, which is great. Like, it's a really fun thing to do, too, because then it makes that writing process a lot more enjoyable. You know, you have people kind of, the, almost, quote, unquote, there with you in the room just to kind of, you know, be like, oh, yeah, that 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 riff, that one that you can, that one's awesome. And it's it's kind of nice to have that in that process instead of, you know, just three guys sitting in a locked up room together for months on end. You know, you kind of build a bubble when you're in that scenario. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing, right? I mean, you can you can do all kinds of things like building a new album from scratch. You can literally do that in front of an audience. And that's a big part. And they can play a big part in the journey, which is an interesting. that's never really been done before, really. Right. Obviously, I, lots of bands are doing covers. Actually, I should ask that just as a fun question. What's your favorite cover to do? To perform? To perform. Uh, probably, I mean, right now, for the ones that are released, probably our Blind Guardian cover of uh, the Bard song. But with some of these new ones that we're working on, I feel like that may be uh, taken out of the first slot here because there's some of these covers we're working on are going to be a lot of fun to play. Can you mention them, or is that, too, or is it too soon? Oh yeah, no, no, no. It's uh, it's it's public knowledge. I'd, I'd have to pull up the list because I forget the names of some of the artists here. But let's take a look at what some of these covers we've been commissioned to do by our by our fans. All right, there it is. So, "Bewitched" by Candlemass. "Welcome to the Black Parade" by My Chemical Romance. Ooh. "For Victory" by Bolt Thrower. "The Ballad of Thunder Road" by Robert Mitchum. Uh, yeah. The song Stones from the Ultima video game and Watch Our Masters Bleed by the Neptune Power Federation. So, I mean, a lot of these are going to be pretty fun for us to do because they're, oh, yeah. they're songs that sound nothing like the music we play. And so that's our challenge as a band. Create a cover that, if nobody knew any better, would sound like an original. So it's done in our style, but enough that it also does honor to the originals and doesn't, you know, ruin them. Because that's a big thing when you're covering these bands. It's how do you do them in a way that's impressive and enjoyable for both your fans and the fans of the original, rather than just completely butchering it. Which at least, you know, there's a market for that, but it's not the market that we currently sit in. Well, no, I, I think uh, the master is probably Manson. Like some of his covers for some of the stuff he did were just absolutely incredible. He made them his own, which was, I think what every good cover song does I, you don't want it's cool to have like an artist like do a cover song in their voice but if there's not something that from the band it does it misses something and at the same time like you said you don't you definitely don't want to like spit on whatever someone else built prior to you because it's a great song otherwise you wouldn't be doing a cover to it yeah absolutely yeah all right so uh so i guess i guess then the goal is i guess who knows what's going to happen in the next like like two weeks with everything that just came down but at some point touring will happen again even if you just have to bring your own tent somewhere and go hey guys i'm just gonna pull up and play because <laughs> right? i might come to that who knows? right um but I, I feel like um you guys are going to get on the road again do you want to go more worldwide or do you want to stay in can like what are you guys have like goals that way you've thought about and talked about yeah, I mean, the goal is really to be touring internationally, right? Especially in Europe. I mean, the amount that we would pay just to file for visas in the U.S. is how much it costs us to fly to Europe, right? So we might as well be touring somewhere where not only is there, you know, a huge market for it, like in a place like Germany, for example, but it's also just procedurally, it's a lot less to go through to tour those kind of places. And you get treated better, too, because, you know, those countries are really well known for their hospitality for live entertainers. They they have a deep respect for them rather than just like a standard tolerance for musicians. So it's, it's the kind of place where if you can get over, 
and you know you can get in with the booking agents and start getting on some of those tours and festivals etc they're they're really the kind of places where you'll thrive and enjoy what you do rather than you know just kind of survive and i feel like that's what we've been doing for the past year with all the bullshit that's been going on is just we've been surviving as a band but i wouldn't say that we've been thriving just by the nature of how much everything has been completely fucked up no it's yeah actually of all <laughs> like i like music's probably probably got hit the hardest maybe the only thing i can think of that got hit harder is like theater stage that's the only thing i can think of that possibly got hit harder than you did right because you, you can't go into a theater right now right you, so that's out you guys can't i mean you can travel i guess but that doesn't seem worth it right now no matter how you just how you figure it out it's like that seems like a pain in the ass so yeah no i yeah with everything going on it's like it's about tr just getting maybe just getting somewhere over there and just staying there for a little while would you guys do that yeah i mean given the right circumstances of course yeah because it sounds it it sounds like you, you like you just want like those would be the places you'd want to go and then stick around and tour and just maybe do do a loop there for an indefinite amount of time and then occasionally coming home. So it sounds like to me anyway. Yeah, I mean, again, it's all about circumstantial situations. I mean, right now nothing is guaranteed, right? We have friends that drive sixteen hours to play a gig and then show up just to find out that the show is canceled because of COVID or something stupid like that. So we can't afford to take too many hits. Like this is a sole proprietorship for lack of a better term so you know oh, no, when there's it's... only one or two guys paying for everything you can't really afford to take too many hits if things go wrong so we're playing our cards very strategically right now because the last thing that we want as a band is to burn out from you know all these failed gigs and attempts at crossing the border going wrong and all that kind of stuff and then have our music and then have our fans kind of pay that price we'd much rather play it smart and then see where we can go at least from here locally and then online and then look towards international no i i totally get that um i'm a little shocked though that the u.s treats like musicians as badly as they do is this a recent thing with everything going on or is this, this has always been an issue i mean 10 years ago it maybe would have been a thousand bucks to file visas for your entire band and now just with all the bureaucracy kind of crap put into place it's just yeah it's a nightmare process you just got to file your visas eight months in advance and you know you have to have contracts for every single gig signed by the promoters, exact itineraries, all that kind of stuff. Like they, they don't fuck around. Whereas in Europe, you just show up and like, why are you here? You're like, oh, we're playing a concert. You're like, great, have fun. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the way it should be. That's honestly the way it should be. Exactly. No, it, 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 it's a weird time. I'm, I sincerely hope next year is a lot better. But I'm, I'm, I'm starting to notice the pattern, and I have, a, I have a hunch, and I, I'm like, okay. Well, we won't go there. I don't think either of us really want to go there tonight. Um, I think, um, so I guess, I guess the, again, another question to ask you then is with everything you're doing, like you got, you got, you got plans, you got kind of wait and see for, um, what has been the biggest discovery in this time? Cause obviously, even though you can't tour, other opportunities have come up as a result. Like what has been the biggest surprise for you? Um, Honestly, it, it's been this whole Twitch thing, right? Like, because we started this in September, like it's been a very new venture, just kind of jumping online and involving the public in your process. But it's not only been the payoff, you know, financially, but even just the reception from those people. It's it's almost like building a separate community, like a subset of your own fan base. And yeah. now you have your fans and then you have your Twitch fans and they're a lot more involved. They know all the little nuances like, they're almost like auxiliary band members at this point because they're like, oh, well, you know, you know that Jake is going to do this thing that you hate or, you know, um, you know that you're going to end up doing this in a way where it's, a, you know, it'll affect you know, Jake in this way. Like they, they understand the inter-band politics and dynamics because they get to see a lot of that actually happening in the moment. They, they're almost like family members at that point. You know, they know a little more about you than you think they know. But that's a good thing, right? Versus just knowing you as your stage persona and what you are on music. Like they've even started sending memes and just making memes of the band and of us and things like that. And that to me is like a sign of love in the sense of they're a lot more invested now. 
they're yeah. they feel a part of it and i want them to be a part of it right like those are the people that i love the most as far as you know surprises and people that get involved with our music that's the best thing is people that take the time out of their day that just want to be a part of the process well that's why i love twitch like this might be the most in i, I don't know if you guys have a discord i'm assuming you do but if you don't like the, i think the video game like these are, this is still essentially a video game community, right? Although it's definitely expanding. Um, but they're the most passionate fans I've ever seen. Like, by, like they, they, and they're all, like, they're, they're, like, they're your own subset of people that just go out there. They believe in you. They're coming here to watch you. Like, here, they watch me talk. They watch you perform. They're not, and you're not even necessarily always performing. You just say you're rehearsing. You're working on songs, right? And they're part of that. Um, that is such a that is such a vicarious experience and still a very new one, right? Some bands were jumped in early, but it's almost like it almost has to be kind of a norm. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Yeah. So, I, I, so how did you guys just stumble on the Twitch? Was it just in a recommendation, or were you guys gamers? Like, what was the? Um, no, we were, we were kind of inspired by our friends in Unleash the Archers because, um, Grant and Andy and, and most of the other band too, but, uh, Grant and Andy specifically were, you know, streaming a lot and we were seeing the work that they were doing and the kind of stuff they're doing and the types of engagements they were having. And we kind of reached out to them and said, you know, Hey, if we're interested in doing this, like, you know, best way to start things we should look into, et cetera. And we already have most of the equipment because we already record everything ourselves anyway. Right. So all you're basically doing is throwing OBS and a camera and a couple of lights on, and you're basically running the exact same process you already are. So now I've upgraded a little past that, but the general point was seeing them and their success in it inspired me to want to explore that channel rather than basically saying, okay, album's been out for a month, like time for everyone to stop giving a shit so we can, you know, just be left alone for another two years and we'll release another album in two years. It's like, it feels like nothing's really changed for us as far as momentum because continuously day in day out we're still working through previous commitments from this album or you know more things that we need to get done and we still have people that are there for that so that to me in a time where you can't be out touring and playing shows yeah again it's just like one of the most valuable things we could possibly have absolutely well, the other thing too is I think the like one of the other like age-old ideas that has gone out the window, and no matter what genre, no matter what what medium you play in, advertising never stops. I mean, and I, that actually might be the job of the whole process. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd completely agree. Yeah. Um, I've told bands before that I've kind of helped, but it's just if you're not spending at least what your album costs in just PR and advertising and marketing and promotions, then you're doing yourself a disservice because what's the point in putting out these incredible products for nobody to hear them, right? Well, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the reality is, I mean, about the music industry, like, there is intellectual property is probably the last big money area let, yet. Like, for you guys, I mean, there's always a possibility, again, a song, there's might make a video game or a movie or or a possible, a possible, like it gets shared somewhere where you guys get revenue. It's a big part of your, it's, it's a big part of the model. It's not just selling in one thing, like an album or a t-shirt. It's getting it out there so people can hear it. Like, so they can go to you guys, hey, we like your sound. Maybe you can work on a project here or a project there, right? Because you know, again, everything you do opens doors. It doesn't matter who you are, what, what you're doing. And they may not be the doors you expect, because Lord knows that's never, I've never, it's never gone according to plan for me. I, and it sounds like it's never gone according to plan for you either, right? But the fact that you're out there, you're doing it, and you're, like, you're kind of saying, here I am doing this incredible thing. People respect that self belief. Yeah. No, they definitely do. They definitely appreciate the hustle that goes into it too. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. So I guess I'm going to ask this. And then maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit about your current, like your current, so your, video, your current video and, and your and your and your current album, and kind of just go from there. But the big thing I'm gonna, I was gonna ask is, okay, first off, why the name Ravenous? Like, I, I'm sorry, I, I always I have Ravenous E H here, and I'm just I am a terrible human being for this. But uh, uh, yeah, Ravenous. So what? What Eternal Hunger? 
there we go. I remember names. I'm a professional. I swear to God. But anyways, so where so where does the name Rabbit's Eternal Hunger comes from? Like, explain the mythology of behind that, I guess, or the story for fans. Because I think the name means something usually. Well, yeah. Um, the band name in itself, like my my initials are R A V. So everyone's been calling me Rab for as long as I can remember, basically. Um, and it was some inside joke between myself and a bouncer at a local venue talking about how hungry I am. And he goes, oh, you're ravenous, right? Eh, eh. And I was basically like, yeah, yeah, ravenous. So like, fuck, it's actually a really good band name. And he's just like, well, if you start a band called Ravenous, I'm going to punch you in the face. Um, <laughs> but that's basically how it all started out, right? And then and running it, and then we were like, okay, well, you know, who is Ravenous? Is the name taken, et cetera? There was a, um, a band from Austria, a death metal band called Ravenous. And they had put out one album in 1990. So fuck. 30 years ago, right? And um, and they were inactive at the time. So we we're like, great, no one's using this name. We're going to use this name, et cetera. They ended up getting back together and like playing a bunch of shows and all that kind of stuff during the time that we were a band. So we added the EH suffix because instead of having ravenous AD or whatever it may be, you know, extra suffix to differentiate ourselves, we wanted to use EH because the first CP was called Eternal Hunger. It lines up with our whole mo motif and our name and all that kind of stuff. But then on the added comedy note, because we're the Canadian ravenous, they say, okay, well, that's how you know we're the Canadian ravenous. It's ravenous, eh? Yeah. So that all kind of snowballed in together. But essentially, it was basically just the simple idea of like, hey, that sounds like a cool band name. Is it taken? Nope. Okay, I guess we're going to use it. Sounds fun. Did, did the bouncer punch you? I'm just saying, I no, no I'm, I'm still, I still eagerly await my punch in the face. Okay, well, you know. That, that, that felt like it came from a place of love somewhere somehow. It, it definitely did. It, it definitely, definitely did. did. Definitely did. That's cool. All right. So I, I always ask this because again, the first album I meant to mention earlier is you, you try to figure out who you are as a band. So we talked about your sound. Um, maybe more in depth, like what's the stuff you feel deep down you care about? Because my belief is the album, the book, whatever the case may be is a representation of what everybody kind of stands for. Because it's usually, usually art authentic, usually. So what what do you feel like, what do you feel you're trying to say every time you go out there and you, and you perform something? Ooh, what are we trying to say? Um, or what do you give a elitism and <laughs> eclectic metalheads are the best kind and you know, those that enjoy all types of music typically have richer, fuller lives. I don't know. <laughs> like we're... No, 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 I know. But it just usually, usually, like I said, like, like when I, like I have my book coming out this, this week and one of the things I was dealing about is curiosity, abandonment, and like just some of the themes of the, uh, of the story and dealing with shadows and ego and all that other one fun stuff because I gave a shit about those things, right? They're just things that, that, that kind of hit my life. And I kind of like was looking at, like, and I look at this with every kind of like artist in that we talk about what we give a shit about. It doesn't matter who you are. We, like, even if we're just having fun, right? What are we having fun about? Like, what are we playing with? Because that's, we care, or at least the best music cares, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, for us, really, like the whole notion of like the album title, Hubris and Arrogance and, you know, the demise, one's own demise at their own hands kind of thing. I mean, it's a, it's a common story that's been played with a lot over history, but more so for us, like the topics that we do, like, like you said, if, even if it's something for fun, you still give a shit about it. You know, we have topics like, you know, from history to doing LSD to video games to, you know, white claws. Um, it's yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess it is shit that we care about, but the reality is there's no message in the sense of this is what this specific song is trying to get you to do or to say or to feel. But overall, the overarching thing is like, we play power metal. We want people to feel powerful. We love when people message us and be like, you know, your music's great in the gym or your music's great as an alarm clock to like help me get out of bed and make me go to my shitty job or whatever it may be. We want people to feel powerful. And we feel that way when we play that music. Like that's our authenticity. Whether the topic is about White Claws or, you know, not yeah, giving yeah. up or, or Faust or whatever, it's just that's the overarching message is get that, you know, big buff muscle energy or whatever the hell it may be, but something that just makes you feel good and want to push on because in essence, that was probably the hardest part of what we wrote because we all felt like shit when we wrote this album, right? You're in a lockdown, you're locked in your house. You 
couldn't really do anything or go anywhere. So, you know, we felt like garbage and the real, realistically, the easiest way for us to get through that was to create music that makes people feel good, feel powerful, feel like they can do anything. And that's honestly why your music is so damn cool. Like I said, onwards and upwards is on my, like my, I did analysis in Wonderland Greek mythology matchup for a story. So tumbling in the Wonderland onwards and upwards kind of feels like a good, like uplifting thing. And it, it's, I like close out the list actually. So no, it's awesome. kudos. Like, yeah, it's your kudos to you, your, your, your stuff's really good. So how long has your second album been out? Ooh, good question. How long has this album been out? I think it has been just over one month. It's been it's been five weeks. It's been five weeks. So um, perception's been good. Like I said, I heard about you guys five weeks ago. It's like, oh yeah, man, can't wait to the can't wait. Like you should definitely hear this. Like I said, first was Jolty. Then I went to the record store. I mentioned you guys. Like, oh, they're great. Then I went to another one. It's like, oh, they're great. Like like you have a you definitely have local support in Calgary for sure, man. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's out, like, what has been, what do you feel the reception has been? And obviously it's catching on, like I said, because you guys are getting bigger, even if it's not quite what you were hoping for in terms of performing this stuff in front of an audience. Yeah, no, it's, it's catching like wildfire, man. Like we're ending up on a lot of top lists and charting for the first time, you know, in like different cities all over the world, all that kind of stuff where noticing different analytics coming in from different countries that we previously didn't have a lot of activity. Now we do. And, you know, people like yourselves, you know, constantly contacting us saying, Hey, you know, we want to do these podcasts. We want to do these interviews. We want to do these things. Like, I, I think it's just a good sign that it's spreading and in the right ways. Like we're not shoving this stuff down people's throats. We're still living in the adage of we're doing what we love most. We're doing it because we believe in it. We're putting it out into the world and seeing how how it comes back to us and it's been coming back to us in a really positive way and i'd say in the one month we've had this album out we've hit half the streams that our first album had which has been out for two years right so it just kind of goes to show the way that kind of momentum snowballs and picks up and carries on if you're continuing to put out good music and you know a quality product and luckily i feel like everyone also feels that way about it we worked with a huge producer on it so all those kind of things kind of built in together to really show us that yes, what we're doing, we're heading in the right direction. We're done with the self discovery phase. Now it's more about, we know who we are. We know what our sound is. We know where we're going and we just need to keep kind of pushing along that quest and picking up any little side quests we can find along the way. Yeah. And I'll like, and just keep your shit together. Cause it's actually the, the hardest, the hardest part I've learned is staying on course, mm -hmm. it's not getting on course, but staying there. And yeah. that, that's, that's just a day in and day out, show up and do your shit kind of thing. So, Well, it's also about keeping things fresh, right? Yeah. I mean, a, uh, a band is a lot like a relationship between, you know, between all the people involved. So you got to find ways to keep things fresh and exciting and, you know, find to do things. And you can tell when your partner doesn't give a shit or whatever. And if I got four bandmates and three of them are, you know, starting to slip because they don't they don't feel as electric about things. It's kind of up to the other people that are in that band to, you know, push and want to create a more enjoyable environment. Like you can't just leave people to their devices. Cause like all things, people get bored very easily these days. And that includes the individuals that are a part of a lot of things. You know, I'm sure the crew behind the show arcane, that league of legends show that came out, if there wasn't exciting and constant things happening, it, it wouldn't keep growing. It would become stale and eventually would fall apart. So no matter what it is that you do, whether it's producing video games, producing music, producing TV shows, you have to find a way to keep things fresh and exciting and engaging for not only the consumers, but for yourself as well. And for the people involved on your team. Absolutely. Because it's really easy to get caught in a rut and you don't want, and you never want this. I think the hardest thing I, I realized about this is people talk about doing what they love, but they, but again, but what a lot of people that, are serious but that's don't realize it is a job right it, it, it is a job as much as it is anything else and there's a work aspect to it and so i think the hardest thing about it is days you don't even feel like it you, you, you got to do it you just have to do it and that doesn't mean though the, like you can't change things up you can't try new things and you probably should because it's the only way you're going to stay sane doing anything like this for a sustained period of time Definitely. Yeah. 
but uh, speaking speaking of which, like you mentioned this, so the first album, did you work with a producer on the first album too, or was that more you guys, just you guys? No, that was pretty much entirely self-produced. We worked with a local friend named uh, Sasha Laskow, just to kind of get things glued together a little better. But this time we actually, you know, full on put the full production in the hands of Frederick Nordstrom. And, you know, he's he's the engineer behind, you know, bands like In Flames and Opeth, and Power Wolf, Arch Enemy. Like he's he's done so many massive bands, especially in the Swedish realm, that like he's kind of the godfather of that sound. So to kind of give him all of our materials and trust his vision was a big step for us, right? And it, and it paid off in the end. Okay, so this, this is probably gonna be a big loaded question. What did you learn? Oh fuck! <laughs> how to how to properly how to properly prepare your tracks for mixing was probably actually one of the most important ones. Like working with someone with that big of a reputation, but also that busy of a schedule. There's very little room for error, and there's also very little room for the back and forth that drives most producers nuts. Like, oh, our bassist's grandmother's dog doesn't like the bass tone, so can we change that? And like. You know, and this person doesn't like, it's like, no, it didn't matter. It's what's best for the product, what is best for, you know, the band and what's actually going to work for us as a business. And also how can we communicate that without wasting this person's time? And it, it was an incredible experience because we learned that very quick and efficient communication, but also for ourselves on the technical level, again, like I'm the one producing all of these albums as far as, you know, recording the tracks and getting everything going. It's all based in my home studio. So this has kind of pushed me on a learning journey to be like, okay, how do I get to that guy's level? You know, how do I become the legendary, you know, whatever power metal producer of Canada? That's been my whole learning journey. That's the eight hours a day that I spend. And then the rest is all, you know, basically finding time to eat and answer emails and go mail merch. Right. So that's been the biggest thing. And I think been the biggest asset in our toolkit. So I'm going to ask, how did you meet him? And then I'm going to ask you a question after. So how did you meet him? Uh, who, Nordstrom? Yeah. Uh, we <clears throat> we had a friend of ours that was editing my vocals. He was just kind of putting things into place. And Nordstrom had walked by his studio because they're, they're both in Gothenburg in Sweden. So Nordstrom walks by his studio and kind of doubles back and goes, hey, what are you what are you working on? He goes, oh, this is our my buddy Rab from Canada and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And he goes, oh, let me hear it. So he listens to the track and he goes, this is probably the cheesiest thing I've ever heard. He's like, I have to mix this album. Can you please contact these guys for me? And that's how we got put in touch with Nordstrom and turned out great. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Huh? Like, you know, it's one of those things you never know who's listening when you put it out there. Right. That's really, really cool. So, but you mentioned you did mention something about yourself. So we're just gonna, we're gonna dwell on you, on you for just a second here. Sounds to me, it sounds to me like like beyond your role in the band, producing has been like maybe by just by like you know necessity at first something you've had to learn. But it sounds like you've come to enjoy it quite a bit. Yes, it's definitely something that I'm I'm beginning to do a lot more often and beginning to do for others. Like in the time since this album's come out, um, I've done some production work for a gent band out of Sweden, for a tech death band out of Spain, and uh, for a local person that's probably going to be here in about 20 minutes because we got to work on some tracks that does children's music. And, you know, yeah, like producing has been a really amazing journey for me. And, you know, honestly, it went from, like you said, a necessity where, hey, we got to kind of do this so we can save some money. To now it's no this is something that i love and live for and want to learn more and continuously you know build it into a career and that all starts when somebody hears your work and goes "Shit, man your album sounds really good um can you record us and make us sound that good and yeah the answer is yes and that's been that whole journey is finding not only time to work on the stuff that we have to do for the band but also then to build my own you know production journey so that we can loop it back in so let's say when album three comes in it's like hey i've had two years to learn a ton of new shit let's apply it to our next album because now we have those resources and that equipment it's also a really good business on your end too because like it, speaking just strictly on a freelance writing standpoint figuring out your niche is kind of the big thing you have found a a service people are going to make music for pretty much as long as you know until until the sun dies people are going to make music. So, 
I mean, so people like you who know how actually how to mix and, and, and play with it and possibly, is it like a teaching thing for you too? Because it sounds like you actually are, like you're collaborating and working with other people, but you're teaching them things about how like you were taught from Narsen. I mean, depending on what it is, like I personally have a background in education. So it's not so much that I am teaching them as I'm doing it, but it just naturally comes out of me. Like I will explain things to a person. And if I can see it in their eyes that they just like, I just want to pay you for you to do this. Stop trying to teach me. I can pick up on that very quickly and I'll stop teaching them. But if I see that interest in their eyes that they also want to learn how to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Then it becomes, it becomes less about producing and more about audio engineering lessons. And it's, it's something I debated getting into, but you know, with COVID and things like that, like it's, tough situation being in strangers homes and trying to teach them things in a very personal space where it comes to like audio production. Right. So instead I think we're just sticking to remote work, you know, editing drums and guitars for people and things like that. And just kind of, just kind of weaving my way into the industry. I mean, it's a massive industry with thousands of players, but the, the pie is large enough that everybody can still get a slice. So. Absolutely. And good luck on that aspect of your career, but going back, to ravenous here then so you had a month and you did a video like you actually did like a video like i just saw i your, your pr guy sent it sent the video out so is this was this your first one or was or is this like the first one for this album which video are you referring to i gotta go back and look because you know getting trained for professional here give me a quick second here i'll be i'll i'll answer he, he puts out a lot of stuff on a regular. Oh man. New music, the Alder Queen. Right. So yeah. the Alder Queen is our is our newest video and our third video for this album so far. Um, most people don't know, but like typically when you get an album ready and you set up your PR campaigns and things like that. You have to have it all ready and in hand like six months in advance from its release date. So we needed something quick that we could do because again, we were sitting in a time where we couldn't get together and go out and shoot and do all that kind of stuff. So we did our first video that came out was a lyric video for Die 1000 Deaths and that came out in both English and Japanese. And then Astral Elixir was the second one that we did and that was basically just like the 3D visualizer of our skull kind of waving in the background to the lyrics. And then this one was to have an actual animated music video. We still included the lyrics in it, but it's not that it's a lyric video. It's just we we have an appreciation for like hard embedded lyrics on a lot of things, especially where it's very fast and difficult to understand kind of thing. So yeah, we retold the story of the Alder Queen through basically like shadow puppets on this new music video. And it turned out great. And all three of those videos were done by our buddy Church Grimm. Um, and he just completely knocked it out of the park. He's worked with a ton of other bands. He's an incredible animator and, you know, very easy to work with. So he's the kind of guy that we go to for that stuff now. Like that's another member of our network that we've built. And hopefully though, as things hopefully chill the fuck out, we can then start having, you know, film crews, makeup, hair, and actually like get people together to create actual, you know, live music videos of us. Because to this day, we still don't have any actual music videos with the whole band in them. And that's something that we need to basically rectify over the course of the next year. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a goal. Oh, like you said, puppets are cool. Yeah, there's nothing like actually you want you want to show the case that experience of what you guys are like on stage, right? Because that's what people want to see. Yeah, and in that regard, you know, we do have like we we shot a live DVD, but there was a lot of technical issues that kind of made it just made it impossible to use the footage. So we ended up just shooting a secondary concert um, with Unleash the Archers. And we think we might just just release that. So that's probably coming up some point in December. We'll just basically put it up there and say, hey, here's some actual footage so people know that we're more than just lyric videos. Like, here's us playing this stuff live. Yeah. There you go, take a look. See yeah. what the energy of the crowd is and what the show is like, all that kind of stuff. No, it, it, that makes sense. And I, I feel your pain on DVD stuff. I, I, I know what happens when shit goes wrong. It, it, it really goes wrong. You just, just you can't really fix it. And that's why most major bands have three or four dates that they shoot and then combine all the footage and everything and all the audio, redo all the audio, all that kind of stuff. We don't have that luxury. We just have the one-off. So if it didn't work for that one day, 
too bad yeah. your whole video. Started. Yeah, I know. It, like this is this is a shitty time, unfortunately, for that. But hopefully next year, you know, it, it it'll it'll clear up. I I hope. Or like I said, just get a tent and you make a giant tent to blow it up <laughs> and put it in the park somewhere. It's like, come on, come on, because. <laughs> we'll do a carnival. We'll get we'll get some hot dog guys and some cotton candy machines. We'll just make yeah, it a ravenous carnival. Yeah, and just yeah, and get of course. Food. Yeah, and just have a good time because I think everybody. I I really think at this point everybody would just say fuck it and join in. <laughs> Pretty much. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, on that note, I just noticed that you, you said, like you said, you have a client coming in in about what fifteen minutes. Yeah, probably about ten ish. They're, they're yeah, pretty punctual. 10-ish. So maybe what we should do just for you so you can get to work on your next thing is probably wrap this bad boy up. This was cool. I Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, not a problem, man. No, it's really enjoyable. Definitely had a great time talking with you. Glad glad to hear that people are talking positively about us. Yeah, I, I, like like straight up, honestly, um, I, I can't remember what it's called. It's the record, like the used record store on um, 16th near 10th, like 16th and 10th on the north, just going on the northwest side mention you guys it's like oh man yeah we don't have any other stuff that sucks like you're gonna have to actually go talk to him at some point right because yeah it's just well maybe or maybe they should come talk to us who knows right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah maybe come talk to us but not just them it was it was sunrise sunrise in in, in marlboro uh like i said i'm going all over to see just supply up i'm in canmore right now so i just go to calgary every so often to supply up and get some stuff it was like and it was my friend, like I said, Jolt, he recommended you guys. And it was like, okay, let's see if I can find you guys. And the moment your name was mentioned, no matter where I went, everybody's, everybody's eyes lit up, man. So whatever you guys are doing, it's working. It totally, totally is. Thank you very much, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. So how about we do this? Advertise, I guess, your album, because that, that's important where people can buy it. Because, because where that and how people can find you guys um so everything our website is like the link to everything that we do um ravenous eternal hunger.com but from there you know Bandcamp is obviously the best place to actually buy our stuff because that money actually comes directly to us doesn't get filtered through a label or a distributor or anything that kind of thing and i ship those out personally and then if not that then um yeah just basically catch us on spotify and apple music all those streaming services and then hit us up on twitch ra voltaire ra voltaire so, so V O L T A R. Yeah, like Victor Oscar Lima, V O L T A I R E. Victor Oscar Lima. Okay. V O L T A I R E. Like the like the philosopher. Yep. So we'll see if I got this right because I'm a trained professional and stuff like that. Um, let's see. Did I get that? Is that right? Sure. I can't see your screen, but yeah, let's. I'll assume that it's correct. Okay. All right. And yet that's where they can find you as well. Yeah, that's just where we actually do all of our streaming and all that kind of stuff. Typically, it's on Sundays, but you know, you find a lot of days where you're bored and feel like writing music, so you just fire up Twitch and let it let everyone in on the process. All right. Well, folks, if you guys want to follow them, go follow them. They do good stuff. Their music's really good. I really enjoyed it. Like I said, I using a few of their using one song on there on my I do some on my Alice on my next one. I'll probably use a couple more for sure. So I want to thank Rap for showing up on, on the stream today and for playing up with me for nearly an hour. And to everybody watching and listening, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you want to support this podcast, hit the like, follow button here. I interview people all the time, uh, first-time listeners. For, uh, my book, Alice One, I screwed up on the pre-hour just slightly. I missed the cutoff by like 30 minutes. So go get it December 2nd, not December 1st. So I'm just going to mention that here. And uh, to everything else, Tomorrow, I have Travis Gibb, comic book creator. Come watch that. To everybody watching, everybody listening, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Stay inspired. Keep shining in the dark. And I'll see you guys tomorrow.